And I want to say as I begin this morning that God has a heart for the great and mighty cities that we often write off as too wicked to care about. Open up your Bibles, if you will, to Jonah chapter 4. That's where we're going to be. But let me, let me tell you the story of two brothers that got into a, a fight, and the little one got the worst of it. So as he's going to bed, he's still very mad, and his mom wants to calm him down, and she reminds him, Honey, the Bible says, remember, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And he looks at her and he's just very frustrated and he says, Now, Mom, how am I going to keep the sun from going down? <laughs> Have you ever gotten angry because somebody challenged you about being angry? Welcome to Jonah. He is the man that did not want to be swallowed by the will of a great God. And so when God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great and wicked city, Jonah thought, I don't want to go there. And not just physically, but spiritually as well. He didn't want any part of, of blessing a place as bad as them. So he went the other way. And you know that through a series of events that didn't work out so well for Jonah, he finally decided obedience is the better path. So he goes to Nineveh, but his heart is not in it. He preaches, but he doesn't want the response that he actually gets. He witnesses one of the greatest revivals in history. And now Nineveh and Jonah are wondering, what is God going to do? And God decides to spare wicked Nineveh, repentant Nineveh, the city that God loves, even if his people don't. We're going to see that to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Is that not stunning? A prophet of God thinking God is wrong. Jonah 4, beginning in the first verse, we read these words, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry about this? Did you notice that Jonah was angry because God is slow to get angry? He's not mad at the Ninevites. He's mad at God. You see, Jonah did not like what God is like. He's that rare preacher that wants failure more than success. He doesn't want to see people respond. He doesn't want to see revival. He knew that when God sent him to preach against Nineveh, that God did it because he was really for Nineveh. He wasn't afraid of what the Ninevites would do to him. He was afraid of what God would do for the Ninevites. Because deep down, Jonah suspected that God was a Christian. You see, we, we tend to see the Bible through the lens that Jesus is like God. But the Bible also tells us that God is like Jesus. God did not get converted in the New Testament. God has always been full of love and compassion. And Jonah knew it. He did not like it. In fact, it's very stunning to me. The text in the NIV says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He thinks that God is wrong to not put discriminatory limits on his grace. He thinks God is wrong to not ask Jonah's opinion on what should happen to Nineveh. And he thinks God is wrong after Jonah did what God wanted for God to not do what Jonah wanted. 
You see, Jonah would like God a lot more if God was a lot more like Jonah. God made us in His image. And ever since, man has been trying to make God into our image. And it just goes to prove that you can do the right thing with the wrong heart. Because Jonah is running from God in obedience as much as he ran from God in disobedience. You can do that. You can do the right thing and in your heart still be disobeying God. But you can always expect God to do an intervention. When Jonah ran from God in disobedience, God intervened through a storm, through a fish. And God is going to intervene again with an amazing question. Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, have you considered the legit legitimacy of your anger? Because nothing reveals the condition of our hearts like the conditions that will make us angry. Because anger exposes idolatry. The Bible mentions idolatry and the problems of idolatry over 1,000 times. It is the number one thing that the Bible speaks against. It is the root of all sin because you are replacing God for something else. And God cannot bless that because God cannot lie. God knows that He is above all Else. So, in your life, when you put anything else above God, even if you have included God, you can't ask God to bless your life because God would have to lie because something in your life is above Him. God cannot bless the life where He is included, but He is not exalted. Jonah knew this. Because like us... Jonah prayed better than he lived. Remember when he was in the fish? This was what he prayed in the fish. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. He's found something else to be his source of security and identity. And for Jonah, that something else was his ethnicity. Jonah was an Israelite first and a servant of God second. The first recorded words of Jonah in the book of Jonah are, I am a Hebrew. But here's the problem. When you make anything, your race, your job, your health, your finances, your politics... When you make anything in your life more important than God and the source of your identity, the source of your security, you are in a tenuous spot because anything else can be toppled over. And when your idol gets threatened, you will either become fearful or hateful. Either way, you will express that in anger. Now, of course... We have become very good at baptizing our anger. That is particularly why we like us, them language. Because it justifies my dislike for people who are not like me. And it angers us when God does not do us, them. I know from experience what I'm talking about. I have had ugly confrontations in ministry over the years when I have dealt with the sin of racism. Equally ugly is when I have discussed that God does not do us, them, in the kingdom of God. He doesn't do your denomination or your tribe how it's better than another. It's just who loves Jesus, who follows Jesus, who doesn't. And in particular, any time that I have suggested that something is, that is good for America doesn't mean that heaven blesses it, people get angry. I love my country, but I do not worship America. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. 
Listen to this story from Philip Yancey in his book, Vanishing Grace. He tells of a conversation that he had with a man who was a pastor who received his call to ministry in as difficult a circumstance as you can imagine. He was among the soldiers that liberated the horrible Dachau concentration camp. And nothing could have prepared them for what it was that they had to do. They had to go into these boxcars where the Nazis had lined up like timber the emaciated dead bodies of Jewish Holocaust victims. He said, as we took care of those bodies that day, every horrible emotion you could experience was going through me. Hate, revulsion, anger, rage. And after hours of this unthinkable exposure to evil, one of the soldiers, a man named Chuck, was told to go escort 12 SS officers who were in charge of the camp to an interrogation center. He walks off with them in front, him walking behind them, and after a few minutes they heard machine gun fire. Chuck returned, smoke was still coming out of his gun, and with a leer on his face, he said, they tried to run away. Nobody turned Chuck in to the authorities. Nobody reported him. And the man told Yancey, that is the day I heard my call from God. I, I didn't know that this kind of evil existed in the world. And all I knew is I need to spend the rest of my days opposing this kind of evil. But what really scared me was that I realized that day the potential for that kind of hate was inside of me as well. There is no us, them. There's just us in desperate need for a God who is slow to anger and abounding in love. But here is the problem. You see, anger opposes grace. Anger loves to camouflage itself as a passion for justice. A young woman is about to get married. She cannot contain her excitement her parents' nasty divorce doesn't even subdue her joy. Her mother doesn't have a dress for the upcoming wedding, so she goes to go shop with her mother to get her mother a dress for the wedding. Her mother finds a beautiful dress. The daughter tells her mother, you look like a million bucks, Mom. So imagine her horror a week later when she finds out that her father's brand new, much younger wife has picked the exact same dress for the wedding. And she asks her to wear something else, but the young wife says, no, I look like a million bucks in this dress too. I am wearing this dress to the wedding. Her mother says, honey, don't, don't worry about it. This is your day. I'll go find a different dress. So they go out, they find a different dress, and the daughter says, so mama, I guess you're going to take that dress back. She says, oh, no, I'm going to keep it. Well, why, Mom? You, you have no occasion to wear it. Oh, yes, I do. I, I'm going to wear that dress to the rehearsal dinner the night before the wedding. <laughs> you like that story. Because there is something that is inside all of us, the spirit of Jonah, that, that says people just need to get what they deserve. And here's the problem. The greatest contradiction in terms in the English language is deserved grace. And if you get what you deserve, you will never get grace. Jonah doesn't have a problem with grace as long as he is the recipient. When he is inside the belly of the fish, he loves grace. Jonah's problem is other people getting what he needed because he doesn't see them as worthy. We're talking about the Ninevites. Jonah thought, I, I might not be perfect, but I'm a whole lot better than they are. As if he thinks saying no to God, which is what he did, is no small deal. Jonah was angry, 
and at the root of his anger and ours is a double standard. He just could not believe that he needed a gracious and compassionate God as much as the Ninevites did. He reminds me of two characters in the New Testament. The first is the elder brother. You, you remember him, the younger brother leaves and goes off to Nineveh and sins greatly. And when he comes home, the father is slow to anger and abounding in love, and the big brother gets mad. He's not mad at his little brother. He's mad at the father for not being more discriminating for when he gives grace to the younger brother. The other person he reminds me of is Simon the Pharisee who threw a party for Jesus and this woman from the street comes in and she has a very sinful past and she is repentant and she is washing Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair and Simon is offended at this and he is angry and Jesus says this one little sentence that says so much. He says, Simon, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that some people don't meet, need much forgiveness. He's saying that people that don't think they need as much forgiveness as them diminish their capacity to love like God. Because Jonah and Nineveh are in desperate need of the same thing from the same God, grace. And the good news is, God is eager to give grace. He is eager to give grace to the unrighteous. And He is eager to give grace to the self-righteous. That's just who God is. He is a good, good Father. And this story is asking us to like what God is like. But it's not always easy, especially when you have seen evil face to face. Have you ever had someone who has come to you that has deeply wounded you? And they ask you to forgive them. But you don't want to. You're not ready for that. You see, here is the thing. I'm not trying to convince you to like God. I'm trying to persuade you and me to want to be more like God. You see, we are not like God unless we love the hard to like. Didn't Jesus teach us that? He said, pagans can do the kind of love where you bless sweet people and you give to people that you know are going to give back to you. But he told us, curse those, or bless those who curse you. He said, give without expecting to get anything back. Love your enemies. Do good to people who actually did evil to you. And then you will be like your Father in heaven. God runs to His enemies, not away from them. And we do the same thing when we find out we're running actually closer to God. You see, God didn't confront Jonah's anger to save Nineveh. He confronted Jonah's anger to save Jonah. So Johannes Burr, the Norwegian novelist, tells this story about an anti-social man that moves to a village. He puts up a big fence and a sign, that big bold letters that say, Keep out. He, he bought a vicious dog. A little girl from the town came to that fence and put her hand through it to pet that dog. The dog grabbed her arm and mauled her so badly she bled to death. The entire village turned against this man. No one would speak to him. They wouldn't sell him groceries. They wouldn't sell him seed to, to plant his fields. He became destitute. And then one day, he looks out and in his field, there is a man planting seed in his field, the father of the little girl his dog had killed. And he goes out and he asks him, why are you doing this? And he says, I'm doing this to keep God alive in me. 
Is it right for you to be angry when you follow a God that went to the cross for you? And he asks you to help him take the word of the cross to your neighbor, to the whole world. Would you stand up and pray with me? Father, I am praying right now in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would go into each heart and do the work that only the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit knows what each person needs to hear today. Maybe somebody right here, right now, needs to deal with some anger in their life. And no matter how much they want to justify their anger, their anger is keeping their heart from drawing closer to your heart. So expose it, God. Give them the courage to confess it. Maybe somebody here needs to deal with fear. Fear of what would happen if they became more obedient to your mission, more generous with their money, more bold with their witness. And maybe some of us just need to deal with apathy. We just haven't looked at the cities and the nations and our neighbors like you do. So God, we like you, but help us to be more like you. We ask this for Jesus' sake, in Jesus' name, amen.